Welcome to Harvard Business Review's The New World of Work. I'm Adi Ignatius, Editor-in-Chief of Harvard Business Review. Each week I put on the white shirt and the blue blazer and I interview a CEO, a thought leader, or somebody else who can inspire and educate us on the changing dynamics of the workplace. Our viewers come from all over the world and they work at everything from Fortune 500 corporations to fledgling startups, from family businesses to nonprofits. The aim of this show is to provide insights for everyone as they navigate this transitional moment in how we organize ourselves in the business world. On today's episode, we have another great guest, Herminia Ibarra, a professor of organiza organizational behavior at London Business School. I'm gonna come back with a proper introduction for her in just a moment. But first, let's hear from our good friends at KPMG, who are our sponsors for this season of The New World of Work. At KPMG, it's our people who make the difference for our clients. Talented teams leveraging the right technology to uncover insights that illuminate opportunity. Ready to make the difference together? Now, before we get started, if you're an HBR subscriber watching this, you can head to hbr.org slash newsletters to sign up for the New World of Work newsletter, where I offer an inside look each week at each of these interviews and talk about some of the most interesting takeaways. Also, if you like content like this, please consider subscribing to our magazine and website. The address is hbr.org slash subscriptions. And if you like hearing smart people talk about some of the same issues we discuss in this show, be sure to check out our flagship podcast, IdeaCast, available wherever you get your podcasts. And remember, you can watch previous episodes of this show on YouTube or right here on LinkedIn and Facebook. So my guest today is Herminia Ibarra, a, prof a professor of organizational behavior at London Business School. Her work has focused for years on leadership and organizational transformation, and she is increasingly becoming the go-to person on the topic of career transitions. Herminia is a prolific author, and two of her books are coming out next month in updated editions. One is Act Like a Leader, Think Like a Leader, and the other is Working Identity, Unconventional Strategies for Reinventing Your Career. Full disclosure, HBR Press is the publisher of both books. So Herminia, welcome. Thank you so much. Hi, Addie. It's great to see you. It's great to see you as well. And great to have you on the show. As I said, I want to talk a lot about career transitions, um, but I want to give a little context first. And, you know, I know your view is that this is an era of constant career reinvention. And I, I want to hear you talk a little bit about why you think that's so. Yeah. And, you know, I've been studying career reinvention for over 20 years now. The first edition of Working Identity was 20 years ago. And the trends just keep accelerating. Um, I think, if anything, we are reinventing ourselves and reinventing our careers more so. Just really quickly, there's four things that are really contributing to this. We're living longer and longer. And so as we live longer, we don't want to have a kind of a long slide from age 40 <laughs> uh, because we could easily be working another 40 years. And so we want to make the most of it. That's one. Uh, two is technology. I don't have to say much about that but it is changing everything. It is disrupting jobs, it is creating new jobs, it's allowing us to work from anywhere. And so it creates a very interesting context for being able to reinvent yourself. Uh, the third one is our companies, our organizations, our workplaces. They are constantly disrupted too. That creates opportunities, but that also creates challenges. We've seen a huge wave of layoffs recently in the tech world, for example. Now people in the financial sector are struggling with high interest rates and what that means for their products, and the list goes on. And so we don't stay in jobs as long as we used to, either by choice or by necessity, as we are asked uh, to leave them. And, and the fourth of the trends, and this one's been going a long time, is that what we expect out of a job has changed a lot. It used to be providing you know, a stable living. We want everything from our jobs. We want passion. We want purpose. We want self-fulfillment. We want flexibility. We want so much from them, and we're increasingly impatient and wanting to move on if we don't get those things. Okay, so that's that's good context. And by the way, if you're watching this, um, if you have questions, your own questions for Herminia, put them into the chat and I will try to get to as many as possible um, later in the show. Um, right, so if, if, if career reinvention, if the need for reinvention is, is such a sort of standard aspect of the contemporary business world, why, why are we having so much trouble still trying to carry it out? 
Yeah. And that's the one thing I've learned. It's really hard. It's really hard. It takes longer than people think. A couple of things. One is most people, I, this is what I learned first. Most people know what they don't want to do anymore, but they don't know exactly what they want to do instead. And since they don't have the answer, and I'm going to come back to this, they don't know what to do. They don't know how to search when they don't know exactly what they're searching from. So that's one. Another one is what we do is who we are. It's such an important sense, part of our identity. And even losing a job that we didn't like is a huge loss because it was what we did. It was the people we spent time with. It was what structured our time. We built up to that. We invested in that. And so the sense of psychological loss is, is a big barrier. The last one we can talk more about if you like, uh, but increasingly, particularly from mid-career on, when we change careers, we're moving into something different. It's not a kind of a linear, more of the same at a higher level, it's something different. And those transitions, I call them under-institutionalized. And what I mean by that is that the steps are not clear, It doesn't. you don't know how long it's gonna take, um, you're not doing it with other people in long step, it's not clear who the role models are. You know, if you wanna be a partner in a law firm, you know what the steps are. It might be hard, but you know what the steps are in the time frames. If you're a law, a lawyer who wants to be, say, an entrepreneur in the arts, that's under institutionalized. There isn't particularly a an educational program that you go to or specific different people move into that in very different ways. And so it's not clear. It's more uncharted. It's unclear how to go about it. So I, I want to come back to the first point you talked about, which is um that we're not that good maybe at, at figuring out what our possibilities are. And I, I identify with that. I mean, you know, most of the jobs I've had have, have you, know, you know, somebody has, has come to me and said, would you like to do X? And even when it's a, a career shift, it's like, I didn't think of it, somebody else did. And so, uh, you know, it's worked out fine. I love my job, but, but you know, there, there's a lack of agency that I think a lot of people feel in terms of getting control, what I want to do with my work life, with my career, and uh, you know, is there advice on how to how to kind of think clearly about possible next steps? Yeah, um, I've got loads of it. Uh, one of the things is we've got to way, get away from the thinking that if you don't know the answer, if you don't know the goal or the target career, you should just wait and reflect until you've figured it out in your head because that's actually not how we figure it out. I mean, it's great when people come to you with propositions. It can be dangerous too because sometimes those things are too close to what you were doing already. And if you do want to make a change, they may not be the best, the best fit. Um, but much, much more important than trying to figure it out is to experiment and to instead of thinking, what's the one ideal job for me? What might be 10 or what might be six organizations or what might be five different pathways I could take and start exploring them uh, in parallel simultaneously because you learn as you go along. Sometimes the things you thought you wanted are not exactly don't pan out to be all you dream them to be, for example. Sometimes it's harder and it takes longer. You've got to do something else in parallel. So the first clear bit of advice and way of doing this successfully is come up with a list of possibilities. I call them your possible selves and start exploring one, two, ideally more than one in parallel. Um, so I... I had a conversation with a headhunter at one point and they were asking me about my job. And I said, well, you know, it ticks all my boxes. I like this aspect. I like this, you know, I feel good about it. I feel like I'm doing something important. And I said, and everyone feels that, right? And the person said, nobody feels that. So if, you ha if you're in a situation like that, you're, you're very lucky. Um, I I'm interested, and you sort of hinted at this before about the extent to which people feel satisfied in their work. Like, like how much satisfaction can we expect from our work? It is work and it's not necessarily our life, although it's a part of it. it you know, from your experience, your research, you know, how many of us feel generally satisfied uh, in our jobs? And, you know, is that the norm or do we have to accept something less? Yeah, I mean, the, you know, the general surveys show a lot of dissatisfaction and that comes and goes. There's periods of that and there's sectors. Um, it, it's important to think that every, you know, a job is not monolithic. A job comes with my job. I love my job. It ticks all my boxes too, but there's parts of my job I really don't like that feel like grunt work. And there's parts that I love and every job is like that. So it really is a matter of proportion is by and large, are you mostly doing the things that you find fulfilling? Um, there's lots of people out there 
who are not satisfied. They may have been, but over time, either they have changed or their organization has changed or the people with whom they work have changed and they're no longer happy about those elements. They don't feel as challenged. They don't like and respect the people they work with. They don't um, align with the organization's mission. All of those things create a dissatisfaction in my sense from talking to my students, from doing my research, is that there's a lot of people who are dissatisfied out there today. So I want to build on that actually with a question that's come in from Hassam in Rotterdam. And a question, the question is, how do you envision the evolution of the quote unquote employee experience in a world increasingly dominated by hybrid work models? <laughs> you know, it's so funny. Um, I was also looking on the website uh, um, that was announcing this talk, and that's what all anybody wants to talk about is how is it going to play out with hybrid? And the thing is, I do not have a crystal ball. I don't know. All I know is that organizations are still trying to figure it out. And they're still playing with different ways and trying to understand the employee experience. But I really that's a that's a question I can't I can't answer. <laughs> Yeah, well, it's we'll 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 keep talking about it show after yeah. show, and eventually we'll, yeah. we'll we'll get some knowledge. So, all right, here's another here's another question from a viewer. This is from Ellie from Switzerland. So it's an interesting question. So how should we think about the balance? You know, if you if you if you switch careers, you you um, you jeopardize some of the seniority you built up and yeah. the 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 benefits and positives that that you've accrued. How 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 can we avoid that, or how, you know, how can we think about that trade off? Yeah, I mean, that's that's another big question. Am I going to have to start at the bottom or, you know, is there a way not to do that? It depends on what you go on to do next. Right. I'm, you know, one person I've been interviewing extensively over the last couple of years was chief compliance officer at her organization. And she's become a documentary filmmaker. She had to start at the bottom as an apprentice. right? So. It depends. Other people move into something that's more adjacent, maybe doing it more entrepreneurially, and they don't have to. They can really leverage the skill set and the experience that they've had, albeit in a very different role and setting. So, so it, it depends a lot. Um, people try um, to solve this by going back to school, and that can help a lot by kind of rounding you out. But what everyone forgets is that there's also, it's not always up and up. So you're saying, okay, I'm here. If I make a change, I'm gonna be here, whereas I could continue moving up and that may well not be the case. The world is changing, jobs are disappearing. And if you're not happy and productive in what you're doing, the curve could well be declining too. And you've got to take that into account. So the other topic that seems to be on everyone's mind is is AI and specifically generative AI. And I don't, I don't, you know, you don't necessarily have a view on this, but you know, this feels like one of these existential. I mean, we're always wondering, will technology take our jobs? And and sometimes it does. You know, with generative AI, we're all asking it at a, a kind of heightened, uh, with a heightened sense of of concern. And you know, it, 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 are, are you are you thinking about this and how this all these topics that you research how this changes oh, yeah. or doesn't change or accelerates, you know, everything you're thinking about. Yeah, I mean, we're t thinking about it as an institution at London Business School. I'm trying to use it as much as I can. I'm interested in how it's changing people's jobs. You know, it's funny today, right before this, my 18 year old walked in and said, you know, mom, we're talking about this in school. And I think, I think I'm always going to remember this day because it's going to be like, you know, for you, if you remember the first time, you know, your first cell phone or, you know, it's, he's, he's, it's, it's going to change everything. And, um, and that was in the context of his school trying to contain it and, and not allowing them to use it in any which way, which of course he felt was not in keeping with the future. But it's, it's another one of those. It's, you know, from my perspective, what I'm interested in is how's it going to transform how people work together, who does what, what organizations emerge. We don't know the answers to those questions. We know we need to be asking big questions about alignment with values. We know from uh, the whole wave of digital transformation that there's the technological part, but then there's the whole other part, which is how is it used? And is the organization able to use it? Are people able to adapt and make the most of it? 
all of those things remain remain to be seen. But certainly, it is worth experimenting with, keeping an eye on it, studying, uh, asking the good questions. So here's a question related to technology. This is from um, Bhaskaran in Bangalore. As I said, we have viewers all over the world. Um, and Bhaskaran says, after working for 21 years in HR, they decided to move to a smaller organization, expecting it to be nimble, agile, and all that. It turned out to be highly toxic. So the question um, Bhaskaran is saying, they long for a new role in organization, but have this constant fear of uncertainty. How does one deal with this inevitable fear of uncertainty when one, you know, is thinking about making a move? Yeah, completely understandable. And unfortunately, often the process of making a career change can be one step forward, two steps back and, and so on. Now you've learned something. And I think part of what you've learned is that you need to really research much more carefully the context in which you're going to uh, and get a flavor of them as much as you possibly can. Um, now you've learned to inquire much more about culture, to talk to the people, to research the organization. All of that is really important. It's one of the reasons why in, in, in the studies that I have done, oftentimes the uncertainty of I don't know what I want, I don't know how long this is going to take, starts to get at people. And then all of a sudden an option comes up, an offer, you know, with the smaller, more nimble firm. And it seems it's the savior. So I'm going to take it because otherwise, you know, I'm still in the throes of what am I going to do without researching it as much as we might, without really looking into what is it that matters to me. And, uh, and the, it's really important to make time for that. So you're going to need, you're going to, in any case, you're out of there. And so by necessity, you're going to deal with uncertainty, but maybe research a bit more carefully. And I feel like we're talking about two things. One is how to think about a, a career transition moment, you know, how to be proactive and smart about that. But then about, all right, you've made the move. How do you transition successfully into this new role? And you know, I'd love to hear you talk a little bit more about that. Okay, we've made the move from A company to B company. You know, then how do we, how long should we give ourselves? How tough should we be on ourselves? Should we read the first 90 days? I mean, you know, how do we, how do we, transition the first 90 days remains the bible on that topic <laughs> right so i that one i give to michael watkins um and it's it's really and and what he says to start with with the first 90 days which also goes to the previous question is the first 90 days actually starts way before with doing your homework and talking to people and finding out the stakeholders um michael has this lovely idea about the 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 i think it's a five conversations that you need to be able to have with your with your boss or whoever your key stakeholders are are about what the expectations are, about how you're going to be measured, about you know the, the, the key topics so that you're going in recognizing the interdependence between your success and that of other people in the organization. Um, so I want to shift gears a little bit, although it's all sort of related, and um, to talk about authenticity, another topic that you have researched and, and written a lot about and are kind of an expert on. Um, I feel like most conversations that I have about leadership, at some point it evolves into a, a conversation about the need for total authenticity at work. I, my sense is you have a more complicated take on all this. So, so how, should, how should leaders think about the authentic authenticity yeah. question? Yeah, and this this total authenticity stuff drives me nuts. You know, uh, what is total authenticity? Is it you know say whatever crosses your mind? Is it um, you know dress how you might dress at home on a Sunday to go take a walk in the park? What does that mean? You know, I I think. I think there's a lot of fluff in all of this. What's the definition of authenticity? Is it a trait? Is it, is, is it an outcome, a process of learning about yourself and trying to be as much yourself as possible? I don't think it's a trait. I think it is a process of learning. And for me, the question is, how can you, we want to be authentic. Nobody likes a fake. Uh, nobody follows a fake. It's bad for your mental health. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm all for it. I'm just, the question I ask is, how can you define authenticity in a way that doesn't condemn you to being as you always have been? We grow, we evolve, we're multiple, we have different facets, different aspects of who we are that play out. And we need to be able to express that complexity and also ask, what does it mean to be authentic when I'm learning? 
when I'm learning. So it's great when it, it's habitual behavior, you know how to do that. But when you're learning, you haven't figured it out yet. And people tend to confuse habitual behavior with authenticity. The minute they're out of the comfort zone, oh, that's not really me. I'm not so authentic. It's it, it, the, the, the comment usually is that's not me. Well, it's not you now and you haven't tried it. And sometimes trying these things that help you to learn feel inauthentic. And if that's the price of learning, I think it's well worth paying it. So I want, I want to push on that a little because I, I, you know, when some people talk about being authentic at work or, or having this that goal of it, I mean, I think they, they they want to be open about who they are, you know, their their personal life, maybe their sexual orientation. Um, the, you know, if they have a kooky sense of humor, they want to be able to bring that. So, so you know, yes, on the one hand, absolutely, you need to learn new skills and 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 you know, soft skills and hard skills, but that you know that that, that people feel anyway, they they would derive a deep sense of happiness if they could be quote unquote authentic at work in the ways that I was talking about. Um, yeah, so see, see, for me, that's much more about sense of belonging. And, and, and being able to figure out, can do I belong here? Or do I have to hide what's important about me in order to be effective here? Um, the, the, the thing with, um, back to the bringing your whole self to work, workplace relationships are relationships. And in relationships, people get to know each other. And the minute that you meet somebody, you do not tell them everything about you, personal life, professional life, strengths, doubts, anguishes, you know, all those, you, you don't do that. You get to know people. And it's very important that we treat authenticity in that way. We're building relationships. And as we build relationships, we want to be able to disclose. Dis Self-disclosure is what builds relationships. So that's really important. But it's not about in every moment being able to broadcast everything about myself um, in a way that doesn't um, that doesn't respect the building of relationships at work. Yeah. I mean, I think some of it, this is generational. I, I think my generation tended not to broadcast everything. I think some of the subsequent, subsequent generations are more comfortable with that, expect that and are comfortable with that. And, you know, part of the intergenerational yeah. workplace dynamic is, is all of us being comfortable with that. Yeah. The other thing about the complexity is that, um, you know, in the workplace, we're also assessing each other for potential, who's going to do well, who's going to advance. And um, we talk a lot about authenticity in the context of being able to be vulnerable and to express vulnerability. But vulnerability doesn't get coded the same way when it's expressed by a man versus a woman or assertiveness doesn't get coded the same way when it's expressed by a black person versus a white person. And all of these complexities come into play, um, which, which we really need to take into account because we each want to put our best foot forward and, and be able to accomplish our goals within the organizations where we work. So, so what is the, the ideal profile of a leader in 2023? What are the, what are the skills or the experience or whatever that, that you think matter most? Yeah, well, you, you guys at HBR have been putting out the headlines on this, and there's, there's a very common drumbeat, and it's been on for a while, which is about the importance of soft skills and people skills, right? And, you know, we've been talking about that for a long time. The pandemic accelerated that, and, and, and really all the complexity of leading today, because ultimately, ultimately, what we've seen in a really deep way is that the problems that face us in organizations, they're big problems, they're adaptive problems. That means there isn't a simple solution to them and you need to harness everyone's energy and, and brains and hearts in order to solve them. And so you really have to be able to get people on board, get them to tell you what they think, uh, get them to work outside their own comfort zones. And all of that requires a set of people skills that most managers today who are successful and who get to the top haven't necessarily developed because they have been rewarded for delivering results in any which way. <laughs> and delivery results is still really important. And so what ends up happening is as people get more senior and they start looking promising, they get a lot of nudges, which is it's really time now to think about how to cultivate this other side uh, which has more to do with how you connect with people, how you bring out the best in 
them, how you create a context in which there is psychological safety. All of that has become much more important, not because it's nice to have, but because the requirements for learning in our organizations have become so much greater. Um, and is your sense that, you know, many leaders have those skills or that very few do? I mean, from your research, what's your yeah. sense? Yeah. Well, you know, I've got a couple of different bases of, of knowledge on this. What is the executives that I teach? Uh, and uh, and they will all, you know, they'll all say I'm great at getting accountability and driving results. And I'm a bit of a micromanager and my coaching skills are not so great. You know, that's that's my most common profile. And as you probably know, we worked on this with um, a couple of colleagues from Spencer Stewart, uh, which led to an article last year, the, uh, the Leadership Odyssey in HBR where we were able to use uh, Spencer Stewart's recruitment data for the C-suite to see, I think the way we framed it is um, uh, most of the executives in succession processes, so candidates, had plenty of developmental opportunities when it came to these people skills. And then we ended up having a look at how it is that they come to recognize that it will really stand in the way of what they want to accomplish if they don't develop these skills and how they go about it. Yeah. So one topic I want to make sure I, we speak about, um, and I'm sort of changing direction here, but it's, it's another area you look at, and that's networking. And I know that's important to, to our viewers. Um, networking seems simple enough, but you know, a lot of us struggle to e even start to build effective and, and meaningful networks. Do you have do you have yeah. thoughts on how to do this better? And, and quick, quick add, uh, just a, a brand new article on, on HBR yesterday on the challenges of networking as an executive. How, what is it that makes it particularly hard for senior people? Uh, to network who, who have their own challenges. Anyway, this topic is of endless fascination to me, Adi, because uh, I started working on this in the 80s when I was doing my PhD research. So I have been following it since. The headline is most of us are bad at it. You know, it's most of, most of us are bad at it. Some people are very good, but most of us are bad. And you can look to social psychology to explain a big share of the why. And the big share of the why is that the way we're built, we are um, drawn to build spontaneously to build relationships with people who are like us and with whom we bump into on a regular basis because their office is next door. So the way I summarize is, you know, the mechanisms are similarity and proximity. That's what builds our networks. We're narcissistic and lazy. We like people like us. It's easier to talk to them. And since we don't have a lot of time, we're going to get to know the people who are easy to get to know because they're next door. And that means our networks are insular. They're not good. They don't help us get new jobs. <laughs> they don't help us step up to bigger roles. And so we've got to work on it. But working on it is really aversive too. And you've published some great research on how that works. It makes us feel a little bit dirty, a little bit uh, disingenuous, a little bit utilitarian using people uh, when we approach building relationships in a more strategic way. It gets in the way of our sense of meritocracy, it gets in the way of our sense of self-reliance. But we know from my research and that of lots of other people that they are vital for getting jobs, changing careers, and being effective and innovative as a leader in the roles which you have already. Yeah. Okay. So any tips on how to build a network that isn't the person in the... Yeah. The make, a, make an effort. You know, the tips are all really simple. Make an effort, join a project, take a course, use an extracurricular activity, make referrals, connect to people, speak at events. Don't do all of it all at the same time, <laughs> but pick a few things. The thing is we don't make time for it because just like in your example, you're waiting for stuff to come to you. These are things that you need to take the initiative on, but it's very easy. And, you know, a great one is just, you know, pick a few people you've lost track of, you know, connect to them, write to them, say, hey, I'm thinking about this. I, it'd be great uh, to catch up with you and have a conversation about it. How about it? Very easy to do. It's just that we don't. I want to come back to, before we run out of time, to one thing you talked about, which was, you know, I forget how you phrase it, but, but really, you know, constant learning, constant adaptation. And, you know, I think a lot of us, are trained to get that next job and then we get we have it and we bring our old selves and uh you know i i thought it was interesting that that you're talking about we need to continually evolve and that authenticity is sort of an elastic concept in that in that sense so 
Talk a little bit then more about, about, okay, we're in a role maybe as a leader, but maybe, you know, a, a manager in the middle, whatever. How do we, how do we adapt? How do we evolve? How do we not just get stuck in that routine that we bring from day one? How do we, how do we yeah. keep, keep evolving? Yeah. Okay. So, you know, there's a life cycle to all of this. So one thing I would say is you've just started a new role. I wouldn't worry about reinventing yourself. You've been hired <laughs> for who you are. Exploit that and, and and make sure, you know, to connect to the stakeholders and everything else. But you're not looking to reinvent yourself here. You're really looking to leverage everything that you bring to that role. Uh, what people forget is that um, expectations of you change quickly and environments also change quickly. So the danger point is really more like a year or two or three, depending on how fast moving your situation is, when you know you think you've got it covered, but people have stepped up in their expectations of you or the environment has changed a lot. And what becomes really important here, the main thing I say to people is think about how you're defining your job, where you're spending your time, what you're allocating time to, and can you think of it more as a portfolio in which some slivers of your time you're going to expect, you're going to spend learning new things, exploring new things, getting involved in projects that give you a more strategic view of the organization, something adjacent to what you normally do, but something that really allows you to keep expanding the frontier as opposed to settling into a comfort zone that's going to make it make you much more vulnerable to the what got you here won't get you there phenomenon. Yeah. Does that answer your question? That and answers my question. You know, working your network. Yeah. It, you know, people get comfortable, you know, there's a set of usual suspects that you keep turning to, no fresh blood, and you become very insular in your views. Um, so, Hermione, we're out of time, but I, I want to th really thank you for being on the show. It's great to see you again and great to connect in front of lots of people who are who are contributing a lot of questions and are very engaged. So thank you for being it's on the show. You. Thank you so much, Adi. Hope to see you in the flesh very soon. It sounds great. All right. So that was uh, Herminia Ibarra, again, a professor at London, London Business School. I want to thank all of you for joining us today. Just a reminder, you can watch previous episodes of the show on YouTube or right here on LinkedIn and Facebook. My guest next week, so that's Wednesday, September 13th at 12 noon Eastern time, will be Andrew McAfee, a principal research scientist at the MIT Sloan School of Management. His research focuses on how information technology changes how companies perform, organize themselves, and compete. And he's the author of the forthcoming book, The Geek Way, The Radical Mindset That Drives Extraordinary Results. We'll talk about how the geeks have transformed not just the technology world, but also corporate culture in our business world. So he would argue they've done so effectively. So tune in next week. Now, if you're an HBR subscriber watching this again, head to hbr.org slash newsletters to sign up for the New World of Work newsletter, where I offer an inside look each week at these interviews and talk about some of the most interesting ideas that come out of them. And if you like content like this, why not subscribe to our magazine and website? The address is hbr.org slash subscriptions. And finally, I want to once again thank our friends at KPMG, who are our sponsors for this season of the New World of Work. So thank you all for tuning in today. I am Adi Ignatius, and this is the New World of Work.